Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I just kind of lucked into stuff. I mean, um, certainly I, I grew up uh, watching more TV and more movies than I read books, although I like to read books. So that my, my primary form of storytelling as an audience when I was a kid was television and movies, was, was dramatic shows that were also visual. Um, I'm just old enough that radio wasn't really a player. Whereas Woody Allen, you know, radio was a big deal for him, you know, and, 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 and Orson Welles, who was incredibly visual. If you watch an Orson Welles movie, listen to the soundtrack, it, it's almost all dubbed and it sounds like a radio show. And all the voices are squeezed together and really don't have, you know, they, they don't seem to come from different parts of the room. They seem to come from a booth, you know, and he was a radio guy. Um, so when I came to making movies, it, well, I didn't know anybody who'd ever made a movie before, or anybody who was in the movie business, and I didn't know anybody who'd ever written a book before. Uh, I did books first because I could afford to do it. You know, I was like, Here, here's something I can do. I can just do the thing itself. Whether I get it published or not, I can sit in a room and write a short story. I didn't go to film school, uh, but I was interested in, in, you know, dramatic stuff. I, my senior year in college, acted in a, in a in a play or two, and I got to direct one, and I liked that. I liked working with actors. I liked acting. I got to work uh, whenever I would get laid off from the sausage factory, the hospitals, or whatever. I got to work as an actor in a summer stock company and direct a few things. And so I was lucky in that way that I got that experience of not only being an actor, but directing actors and working with people to try to help them play their parts and think about the structure of the plays that I was directing. Um, and then I, I kind of segued from writing fiction into writing movies because I was interested in movies and I figured, well, that's the one thing I'm already doing. I was already getting some things published. And, and it just by chance, uh, I had to sell my second novel when I wasn't around. I was up in New Hampshire acting in a, in a summer stock company. And over the phone with a guy I'd never met, I said, will you sell my book? He was a literary agent. He said, well, my agency has a deal with a film agency, so, you know, it's probably nothing's going to come to it, but automatically not, your novel is being represented as a property that could become a movie company in, in L.A. And they said, oh, what's the guy's phone number? Mm -hmm. And then I adapted L.A. Bazinoff's book, Eight Men Out, into a screenplay when, when I called up and said, could you rep represent me as a screenwriter? And they said, well, send us an example of something you've written on a screenplay. So I adapted that, sent it out there. The head of the agency, it turned out, had been Elliot Azenoff's literary agent 25 years earlier when the book was published, so he knew the material very well. And he said, ah, you'll never make this thing, kid. But he did a good job, so come on out here and maybe we'll see what we can do for you. And they assigned an agent to me. And the first thing I got was Piranha. And I learned later that part of the way I got that was that Frances Dole, who was Roger Corman's assistant, she was kind of the reverse of the kid who's in class He's supposed to be reading Chaucer, but inside he has a comic book. She would have the comic book on the outside and actually be, be reading Atlantic Monthly Magazine and had read a couple of my short stories. And so, oh, the short story, right? Sure, we'll hire him. Um, and then from writing a couple of scripts, back when Roger was a signatory to the Writer's Guild and was getting a whopping $10,000 a script, which was to be a fortune to write a screenplay, um, which took a fraction of the time of writing a novel. Um, the guy who ran our summer stock company said, we know so many good actors, why don't we make a movie? You know, and I had $40,000 in the bank. And uh, all these actors who I worked with in theater were about 30. There were a bunch of them. They weren't in Screen Actors Guild yet. We had been putting people up in this old ski lodge when we had our theater company, which worked out to about $1.50 a night per head. So I had a location, and I, I thought of, um, well, I'm not going to get an experienced crew. We're not going to be able to move the camera much. How do I have them? The movie has some movement in it. And I had just seen Robert Altman's movie Nashville, which has multiple characters. He's always cross-cutting between subplots. I figured, well, if it's about a bunch of people, I can cut from plot to plot to plot. And at, least, at least have editing flow to it, editing movement, even if the camera never moves very much. And uh, so I made it about a bunch of people turning 30 who live in, a, you know, are re reuniting, having a reunion uh, in some place that looks a lot like an old ski lodge, you know, surrounded by the woods. 
and there's a scene in the little theater, you know. Uh, most people would have done a horror movie in that case and had them killed one by one, <laughs> really grisly ways. I wasn't that into a horror movie, although I had been writing them. Um, but that movie got enough on the map that that actually the first thing that happened is, is in Hollywood you get typecast as a writer or a director just as much as an actor. So Joe Dante, who directed Piranha, the next two things he got um, offered were Orca 2 and something called Swim Thing Team and a movie called Jaws 3 People Nothing. Um, all aquatic horror movies, not just horror movies, and he hates the water. <laughs> Didn't do any of them. But once I did Super Hawk 7, it was, oh, this guy does human beings too. He doesn't just do creatures. And so I actually got more writing work that was about human beings by proving to people with this movie. Not that, that it was really that much on the radar, but they could look at it and say, oh, you wrote those people pretty well. Did you write them? I was. Yeah. I was Katie, the hostess. Yeah. And, and pretty much co producer. Um, but, but so I, I think that, you know, the thing is that it's not a stable world. So what existed in 1978 didn't exist in 1982. And it certainly doesn't exist today. And just like the technology of video, which is changing every, you know, has a half-life of about three months now, uh, the movie business is that volatile, and especially the margins of the movie business are that volatile. Right now is actually a good time to make documentaries, and you have a better chance of getting them seen by some kind of an audience than, than almost any time in the last hundred years. Uh, plus, digital exists, so you don't have to pay for all that film stock. You can shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot, you know, and then it's the editor's problem. To talk, deal with we, we talked about this last night, yeah. too, about, before we forget. So, talk about the, the shoot and shoot and shoot versus yeah. the... the you know, yeah, and this is, this is a problem with features, too. I, I know Alfonso Cuaron a little bit, and when he went off to shoot one of the Harry Potter movies, the studio insisted that he have six cameras running at all times. And he said, maybe there's two good angles of a lot of these things. There's almost never three, and there is never six good angles of these things. But they insisted. So he would have guys go out in the parking lot, you know, and just say, shoot somebody. They're not going to look at it, you know, it's be roll or whatever, you know. Um, but some poor editor had to look at this and what, what's this parking lot? <laughs> what does this fit in? Is this like a flash forward into the future? Um, so, so what that's about, and Alfonso, is perfectly capable of this, even though he now works with bigger budgets, is you have to make some decisions at some point. As a low-budget filmmaker who's making features, I have to make a lot of them as I'm writing and do a lot of my editing as I'm writing, because anything that I write that I then cut out of the movie is waste. You know, that's a half a day that costs a certain amount of money and location fees and this and that and the other thing that doesn't end up on the screen. So if I can eliminate it now, I can save $50,000. That's a lot. By just going, Shh, you know, uh, if you can eliminate two pages that you don't need, you know, that's that's maybe $100,000, or, or in my case, 50 still. Um, but if, it, you're a, if you're a huge movie, that could be a million dollars that you eliminate by not shooting that scene. Then I also, because I'm editing my movies but directing them, I'm editing while I'm directing. I'm, I'm saying, I've got that. I don't need to shoot from this angle again. You know, and I've had actors many times say, whoa, 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 how can we go to another scene? I just, I just blew a line every take that we did. And I say, you, you blew a different line every take. Yeah. Your acting was good, I've got three angles. I've got, it. this is not theater. You don't have to do a soliloquy and nail it every single line. As long as you're inhabiting the character, and I've got these angles, I can use this from take three, and this from take one, and then go back to take one, then go back to take two, you know, and put it together with everything. And it's a new performance. This is a collaboration between us in a movie. It's not theater. Um, so when you're making a documentary or anything, whether it's a feature, at some point you have to say, I've got this, I don't need to shoot anymore. Anything more is just going to get in the way. And it may be, it's going to get in the way of my editor when they have to sit down and even catalog all this crazy footage. So let's think about what I need, what I'm interested in, what's not good. You know, even to the point of, yeah, well, you know, maybe maybe that was all garbage. I fast forwarded through it. Let's tape over it. Use that tape again. You know, then the editor doesn't have to look at it because there's nothing there. Um, in 16 millimeter, you printed everything. Uh, 
Uh, they, you know, it was short enough that the, the lab said don't pick takes. In 35, because it was, you know, every bit of footage that you actually printed, you had to pay for extra, um, you picked takes. And if there was only two minutes of good stuff on a 10 minute reel, you didn't print those, those eight minutes. You had to make that decision. Now, your script supervisor was putting down what went on there. So later on, you may say, oh, I need something where the character looks left. Let's go back and see, let's print this footage and see if they ever look left. But usually, that, that stuff just never got developed. Um, so, and I think that in a documentary, yes, you're going to do a lot of the writing and the editing period. Um, but really, there should be some mind at work, some director's mind, some writer's mind at work, while you're taking it and saying, this is useful, this is not. This is interesting, this is not. Somebody's got to catalog all this stuff, whatever. And so, even if it's just